I've been studying youth and social network social media for about the past two years. And so today I want to first start off by saying I am in no uh, way an expert in youth development and youth organization. So what I'm here today to do is to pose some general trends that I see happening and that have been written about as happening in education, government, business, national and global trends, especially as they relate to youth. And then we're all going to think about how this applies to our work, our organizations, and what we do with youth on a daily basis. Okay? So there'll be lots of time for questions um, at the end of this presentation. So this is sort of where we're headed. I'm just going to talk to you about how communicating with the Web 2.0 generation, because they are somewhat different in terms of the communication styles. Then we'll dive right into social network sites. What are they? Um, we'll talk about teens' use of social network sites in particular. And then finally, we'll get to implications. OK, this next slide is going to, uh, here's the quick, take a look. OK, um, I'm going to ask you some questions about trends in youth's use of technology. So I want you to shout out some percentages. So if we're thinking about youth 15 to 17, and I know some of you work with younger students, and some work with older, but think about youth 15 to 17. Um, National studies of youth 15 to 17 have looked at their different technology uses. How many, what percentage of youth 15 to 17 do you think would own a desktop? Percentages, nationally. Is it 90%, 80%? Just shout out some guesses. 70, 80, 99, 85, okay, it's pretty high. Laptops, how many youth do you think would own a laptop? Percentages. 65, 50, someone said 20, okay, keep these in the back of your head. Finally, cell phones, what percentage do you think own cell phones? 100, 100, okay, well here are the actual answers. So uh, as you all suggested, yeah, desktop ownership uh, is very high, upwards of 80%, laptops less so, but that percentage increases when they get to college. So these numbers are slightly higher at the University of Minnesota for laptop use. Um, cell phone, actually, 76%, so, but they are very mobile, very connected. And then, of course, Palm Pilot, iPod, maybe a little bit less so. But basically, the trends here are that teens are very mobile and very multi-channel communicators. This is based on Pew studies of youth in American life. 93% um, of, of students, and by the way, these are national studies, so this is youth of all uh, socioeconomic uh, incomes and gender, ethnicity, all factored into here. So these are averages. But 93% go online, 15 to 17. And I thought the interesting thing here was, in terms of communicating with youth, you can see that uh, meeting in person is sort of fourth on the list. So they are using cell phones, texting, using social network sites. The top three ways they want to communicate is through digital technologies. They are mobile, they are immediate, and they are multi-layered communicators, okay? So they are on the go using their mobile devices to stay in the social loop. They are immediate communicators, and they are layering different communication technologies over one another. Cell phones, texting, social network sites. And this is all part of this trend uh, that we call convergence culture. So we have people um, today you have all these different forms of communication, audio, video, text, all converging into the cell phone, these handheld devices. And what does that mean for us? So here are three trends I see as impacting all of us and the work we do today. We have this transition from Web 1 to Web 2, and I'll talk to you about what that means. Web 1 was an information source. Youth went to get information. They didn't contribute information. Now we're into Web 2. Also, over the past few years, several researchers have documented this disconnect that kids feel between the ways they communicate and the ways they're asked to communicate in school settings, both inside schools and outside schools. It's a digital disconnect. Thirdly, we have new waves of competencies, things we want students to be able to do, to be prepared and proficient in the 21st century, new literacies, 
technological fluencies. And all of those have implications for our youth with work, I think. And finally, we want them to be prepared for their future workplace. And we want them to be participating in the shaping of a democratic culture. We thought, saw this in the presidential election. We saw amazing participation from people of all ages. OK, now let's dive into social network sites, the topic of today. I want to give you a little bit of the history. Uh, where do these things come from? Uh, what are they all about? What makes them so unique and popular? Well, and I'm sorry, I, you can't really see this slide as well as I would like, but just know that the first inklings of social network sites really began in 1997. And it was really in 2003 and 2004 where they started to rise to mainstream prominence with MySpace and Facebook. So Facebook in 2004 started out on a college campus. Um, it was opened up to all people in 2005. So really 2004, 2005, these things started to explode. What you may not have realized is that there are hundreds of niche networks. So MySpace and Facebook tend to get the most press but there are hundreds of networks, and that MySpace and Facebook get more hits than Google. So a lot of you probably heard, have heard about gaming environments, that these are really popular among youth. Social network sites are more popular than gaming. Okay, there's a higher percentage of youth actually spending time in social network sites than in gaming environments. And if you think about it, a lot of times when you play games, you have to download specialized software. There's a high learning curve. Social network sites are free. You get on there, and very quickly, you can figure out how to use them. And a lot of youth get pulled into the networks by their friends. OK. Raise your hand if you have a profile on Facebook. Terrific. Uh, raise your hand if you have a profile on MySpace. Finally, raise your hand if you have more than one network, more than one uh, profile on a social network. OK. So these are not just uh, youth that are using these things anymore. So here are some uh, demographics of social network sites. This is from June of 2008. These numbers are more like 120 million users uh, and higher today. But again, just to give you a sense of Facebook and MySpace have really pulled away in the social network uh, environment to be the leading two networks. That's where you'll find most of your youth today. They're also quite diverse in their demographics. So Facebook tends to be, uh, half of people on Facebook are college age. MySpace was always the site of the entertainment industry, a lot of artists, photographers, musicians, uh, originally converged on MySpace to promote their work. MySpace also has a very varied demographic. 85% are older than 18. And of course, you have LinkedIn. It's more of a business community. These sites are very popular. So the majority of US teens, 12 to 17, have a profile on a social network site. Uh, among college students, that percentage is even higher. So a lot of times, you, teens get exposed to social network sites in high school, and then, especially in the later years of high school, and then move into using them uh, seamlessly throughout their lives in college. Nine hours a week they're devoting to these networks on average. And I will say that in a study I did with uh, Twin City teens, teens from low-income families, 600 students, these numbers are just as high. 77% of teens from low-income families in the Twin Cities had a profile on a social network site. And these, that, that number actually is borne out nationally um, in talking to the Pew study. So it's not just the affluent students who are using this. It's really people of all income levels. It's also people of all genders and ethnicities. Okay? Uh, and finally, it's people of all ages. So we tend to think of this as a youth phenomenon, but that's actually changing. In fact, the 35 to 54 year olds are the fastest growing demographic, basically doubling every six months. So all of us are getting on these networks too. This barrier between youth and older, us, our age and older, is rapidly disappearing. So why are these things so popular? Well, 
Online communities have been around for a long time, but social network sites offer some unique features that I think youth are finding incredibly engaging. One feature is this ability to create a customized profile. Unlike Web 1.0, where everyone went to the same website and had the same experience, it was very much about you went there to get information, on social network sites, everyone can have a different experience because they come in through their own homepage. And they can customize that homepage and profile in the ways they want to communicate who they are, what they're interested in, what their talents are. So this idea that they can have a multimedia profile um, they can represent their different learning styles on these sites. Secondly, and this is what makes them incredibly um, interesting and different from other forms of online community, is this ability to articulate who you're connected to, who your friends are. It's like allowing someone to see your contacts, your Outlook contacts or your contacts or your Rolodex or your address book. All of this is available to your friends. So people can see this Rolodex effect, and they can traverse these networks looking for people to network with or friend. That's what makes them extremely unique, is this Rolodex effect. Thirdly, they are really a one-stop shop for the communication styles that we talked about. So if we talked about teens want a multi-layer communi communication, they want to chat, they want to use cell phones, um, they want to use audio and video, Social network sites allow all of those things within a peer group environment. And finally, on social network sites, people are as important as the content they upload and share. So social network sites are not just about content, they're about the people behind the content and the interlinkages between people. And that's why I think what makes them so exciting for kids. Here are some of the features. So you can see, again, it's a real emphasis on getting beyond text as a way to communicate who you are, what you're interested in, different sides of yourself. A lot of the, the youth we spoke with um, talked about music as revealing who people are. So you can have audio, video, image, you can have your own journal, blogging. There's an opportunity for feedback in multiple ways, like kudos, like voting on things. There are forum spaces like bulletin boards. So it's basically taking some of the features you've seen in other communities in the past and putting them all together in the same place and then make the people around these things as important as the content. Then customizable designs, that's another thing, sort of that wallpaper effect. I can put up my, if you can put up a poster in your room to say this is what you're interested in, you can do this in these online spaces as well. That's, that's very exciting and new. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about trends. What makes them so popular? Well, we kind of talked about the different affordances and why people, especially young people, are using these things. How are they using them? Why are they using them? and then we'll hopefully get to implications. So I also just want to say here that the research on this is still emerging. If you could think about this as a relatively new phenomenon, 2004, 2005, and now we're in, research usually takes about three years to, um, to come out after something is developed. So we're just starting to see research from sociology and psychology and government and education and all these different fields on what the impact of these things are having on our society. But really, it's, uh, I think it's about, at its core, relationship building, both face-to-face -face and online, and the interrelationships between the two. So how are youth using social network sites? One, to deepen and extend their relationship. And in this, we can look to the work of uh, social capital theory, and my colleagues at Michigan State, Nicole Ellison and her colleagues. And I think this has important implications for us, us as youth workers and educators. But basically, uh, recent studies have found that these social network sites may actually help youth develop their relationships and multi multiple kinds of relationships. So we have three different kinds of relationships here, all of which can be developed through social network sites. One, 
the close relationships, the bonding relationships, your, your, uh, your family, sorry, well, I'll start with bonding, your family connections, the shoulder to cry on, your intimate relationships. You can see different sides of your sisters, your brothers, your sister in another state, and keep tabs on them through these social network sites. So if your sister goes away to college and you wouldn't talk to her for months, now you can keep up with her every day. And so it helps deepen the relationships with people in your family and those close ties. Secondly, the researchers found that social network sites can help you develop your relationships with friends and friends of friends. It can help you network. Youth often say that in joining a social network site, their relationships with people at school are deeper than before they joined the social network site. Because again, it's a very low cost way to keep up with what's going on in the lives of your friends and friends of friends on a regular basis. Versus calling someone is very high cost. Making time for a phone call, making time for a meeting is high cost. And finally, and I think this is most interesting, this idea of maintained capital. That social network sites may be incredibly useful for folks in times of transition when they're feeling socially isolated, like moving from high school to college. And that these networks can help you maintain ties with people you've left behind and get over that social isolation you may feel face to face. Here's an example of one youth talking about how social networks have helped him deepen relationships. He says, I learn more things and deeper things about their personality, talking about friends on the social network, MySpace. Like at school, we wouldn't tell really close or too personal things about ourselves, but on MySpace, they are more comfortable sharing it on there. Now, a lot has been written about the internet as, um, oh, the internet, on the internet, we have reduced social cues, right? You can't see my face. You can't tell if I'm laughing or crying. You can't see me. And sometimes those reduced social cues actually make it easier to communicate. So I may not go up to my professor or my, someone that, I, that works with me in, a, in an after school program, my mentor, I may not go up to you and ask you for help, but with the reduced ba barriers over the internet, with the lack of sort of anxiety that the internet can help, youth may be more comfortable in approaching superiors and others that they don't, uh, don't know as well. So in this case, it can deepen those relationships by making it easier for people to connect. It can also smooth the path, as I said, to offline relationships. Um, this is from Tanya, who's a high school senior, age 18. Asked about her, her MySpace use, she says, I know I'm communicating with people in a different manner than I would if I didn't have MySpace. Sometimes I get more information about a person that I wouldn't have otherwise, like if they're dating someone. <laughs> uh, what college they are going to, like what they're going through on a personal level, what music they're listening to, because you can tell a lot about a person from, a music, from the music. You get afforded different opportunities from the site, like with the presidential campaign, caucus invitation. This person was not at all involved in politics, um, and she got interested in politics through uh, her, her social network that invited her to an event for Obama in the state of Minnesota. And she went to it and she ended up voting for him. And she said she would never have gotten that involved if it hadn't been through her social network. So there's also the sense of extending connections to people, information, and resources that may not have been available to the student otherwise, and smoothing paths to relationships, making it easier to connect, to then um, connect in the real world. And I, I tell you a personal story, this has happened to me. When you go to a conference, right, let's say there's someone you want to meet, and they're really well known in your field. You think, well, geez, you know, can I really go up to this person that I don't know very well and ask them about their work? Well, sometimes you can see that they're connected to someone else in your network on a social network site. And you can ask to friend them before you get to the conference through this other connection. And so just having the little bit of interaction you've had before you actually are in a face-to-face -face setting might be just enough for you to go up to them and say, hey, I noticed you have a real interest in this musician. Or, I, hey, I loved your photos on your social network site. And that's what I mean. It's sort of a way to smooth paths to an offline relationship 
that you may not have initiated otherwise. And we can think about all the ways we might use that as a tool to build these relationships with youth. Uh, other ways that the research suggests teens are using these sites and why they're using them, well, it's an emotional outlet. So if, if the teenage years, if adolescence is a, a time of, um, what's it, storm and drag, right? Storm and crisis with uh, Erickson talking about um, that it's a time to figure out who you are. And it's also a em very emotional time as you're thinking about who you are, what you're going to do with your life, uh, who your real friends are, who you are as a physical and sexual being. All of that is happening in the teenage years. This is a place to let those feelings out. And we all know we want youth to have a voice because when youth don't have a voice, um, that, uh, bad things can happen. We want them to have a safe space to express themselves. The blogging tool, for instance, is a feature that teens have used to talk about their feelings, what friendships mean, and things that they're going to, through. And also, if youth aren't especially good at writing, social network sites also provide a way to get out these emotions through music, through photography, through video, through other non-text media. Jeremy, a high school senior, says, if it was really exciting, I would post about it. I remember the second I was done, I got on MySpace, talking about a, 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 an essay he finished. I, I was done, I got on MySpace, and I was like, I just finished my extended essay, and it was really good, and it's awesome. And this is an example of my emotion. So wanting to tell someone, tell a community what's happening for you, broadcasting it on any given day is what social network sites offer to teens. Another way social network sites are being used is for this identity work. So trying to figure out who you are. Um, Dana Boyd, who's a social media researcher at Berkeley, calls this the construction of cool. Now in social network sites, there is this sense of both expressing yourself, writing about your true feelings, as well as presenting yourself, portraying yourself as someone you would like people to see you as, construction of cool. So you'll notice when you look at teens' uh, social network sites that most of them, in MySpace especially, uh, mostly in MySpace, that the backgrounds are all different, that no background is the same as another background. It's like a, a fingerprint. Everyone wants to have a background that says, this is who I am. And youth really appreciate when someone spends a lot of time on their background because that is valued in that community. It's a way to be creative. It's a way to construct this cool factor. Um, this Lily says, a high school senior, sometimes when I feel kind of kiddish, I will put on pastel looking backgrounds. Or if I feel serious, I'll put on black backgrounds. But I must remain feminine. So what I have right now is a black background with pink flowers. Now, in the news, in the media, <clears throat> we, we hear mostly negative things about social network sites. So what you've seen for me so far is what I see as some of the affordances of them. And we need to think about maybe the implications for us. But do they have any affordances for schoolwork and for supporting academic achievement? Well, I think that they do. In fact, a study by the National School Boards Association found that 60% of students are actually talking about school-related topics within their social network site. And I found this to be true in my research with Twin Cities teens as well. Here's an example. Lee, high school senior, I was online and I opened up my Word document to type it up and saw a friend online in MySpace uh, was saying how he was doing too on this assignment. And it was really comforting because I knew I was not the only one doing it. And then he would ask, what did you write for chapter six? And kind of share ideas that way. I'll give you another example. I was speaking to a, a student a Hmong student who was having a lot of difficulty with Hamlet. And he was telling me, Hamlet, this, gosh darn, he really, that Hamlet man, he was really frustrating, uh, really difficult to read. And he was saying that during this uh, evening when he was working on his Hamlet assignment and he was just really frustrated and he just wanted to just give up, he dove into his social network site and saw, because so, through MySpace you can tell which of your friends are online, he saw that there was a friend online 
So he opened up the chat window, and they had got into a chat conversation, just socializing. And he said she noticed that he was not very uh, chatty. But basically, he, used, he writes a lot. And his words were not that, uh, he wasn't writing a lot. He was sort of reserved in his chat. So she said, what's wrong? And they said, I'm working on my Hamlet. It's really frustrating. And then he told me that for the next several lines of chat, they talked about it. And she gave him some tips for how to get back in there and do well. And so he said when he went out of his social network site and got back to his assignment, he felt like he could do it. And I found many examples of this, and this has re been reported else, other, um, in other places, that youth are not just using these sites for socializing, as is often mostly portrayed, but that they dive in and out of these sites around school-related issues. And this could be relationship issues, it could be schoolwork issues, it could be just wanting online support for a difficult assignment. Um, and oftentimes, a little bit of socializing around school helps them get back to work and be more productive. Now, there are downsides to that as well, as you can imagine. Um, distraction and staying too long in social network sites. But I just submit to you that there are some benefits, and we can think about how we might use these spaces for feedback and support in the kinds of work we want to do. I mentioned this uh, in the past, uh, support in times of transition. This is Carrie, a high school senior, who is going off to an East Coast school. And she said to me, I think I'm going to be the only Hmong student there. And I'm really nervous about that. And it's going to suck going out there by myself to college far from home. I'm going to need to message people about how I'm feeling. And it's nice to have both Facebook and MySpace, because then you can keep the contacts with like people who uses only one. And she was talking about her friends in high school will still be on MySpace, but her new friends in college will be on Facebook. So she's going to have to keep both communities to talk to her high school and her friends still in high school and her college friends. Finally, the research, and this is my research actually, is focused on teens' use of social network site for technological fluencies and digital literacies. So we have, um, in K-12 education, we have new standards for what students need to learn to be successful in the 21st century. And these are standards we have for students. And as of 2008, they're standards that we have for teachers. And teachers in K-12 schools are expected to model these things. And they are uh, digital citizenship. That's, this, that's not up there. Digital citizenship, communicating in multiple media, being creative and innovative with technology, and basic technological fluencies. Teachers are supposed to model these things, and students are supposed to develop them to be successful in the 21st century. So the question is, is it possible that if students are online nine hours a week in a social network site, where they can communicate themselves in multiple media, that they're actually developing some of these skills that we value? That was my question. What I found was, yes, it, that is the case. We see evidence that some of the skills that we value in school settings, kids are demonstrating in these sites. And they, they have relationships with each other. A little bit of instruction on video, for instance, may find its way into taking that skill and creating a video to promote a sports team, as in the case of one student, taking a little bit of an interest and in instruction in school and then applying it to something outside of school that you're really interesting and in promoting it on your network. So Carl noticed that people like to be more creative with projects because there's so much to do in MySpace. You can change so many things, the picture, the outlook of your whole profile. And so because of that, I think people do try to be more creative and alter things a little to make it more personal to them. And all of this, I think, is just to say, and you know this, I mean, uh, you, I think, have recognized this in your work, that youth today have many choices about where and how and with whom they learn. In school, at home, outside of school, in your organizations, um, and then in, in these online spaces. And this learning ecology framework is something that all of us, I think, are getting our minds around as we th think about how do we take what students are doing in these spaces and their engagement in these spaces and apply that to what we want them to learn and be able to do, and vice versa. How do we learn from them? Um, I think I see, I would just submit, 
three implications, potentially. So what does this mean for us as youth workers? Do we ourselves use these technologies? Well, most of us already do, but how? And how do they intersect with our work? Can we use them for relationship building? If so much of what we do is relationship building, can we harness these technologies for that? And what are the potential advantages, challenges, barriers? I'm going to come back to these questions. I just want to diverge one second, or a few seconds, and talk to you about what's going on in other sectors. So we're in education. What's going on in business, in universities, in the United States government, in the news communities? How are these organizations, sectors, using social network sites internally and externally? Well, uh, this is, a, by the way, this is LinkedIn. This is my profile on LinkedIn. The New York Times in 2008, uh, in surveying businesses, found that many businesses are investing in social network sites for both internal purposes and external purposes. In fact, a study by McKinsey, a consulting group, McKinsey surveyed businesses nationwide. And this survey, by the way, was very recent. So even in this economic climate, they surveyed businesses nationwide and asked, do you anticipate increasing, decreasing, sustaining your investment in social networking technologies? And 75% said that they would sustain or increase their investment in social network technology. So if we ask ourselves, are these things going away? Should we really invest in this? Because you know, in a year or so, these things are going to be out of fashion. Well, the business community and what's happening there, I suggest, says no, that these things are going to be around for a while, and people are investing in them. And what are they doing? They're investing in them to build relationships within transnational corporations. So team, teams across continents collaborate better when they know each other on a little bit more of a personal level. And they're building their relationships and their interpersonal relationships with these networks. And they're also, of course, building their relationships with customers, using these networks to prospect and figure out what customers are interested in. The government is using these networks. In fact, I was just speaking to the communication directors of uh, several state agencies in Minnesota. So these are folks that, are, that asked me, how is the federal government using social network sites as a tool? And so I did a little research, and I found that um, many arms and agencies of the government are using social network sites, like the CD CDC, Centers for Disease Control, put out a Twitter feed about the peanut butter scare. Um, just looking at my notes here. Uh, the White House, USA.gov. The White House has a Facebook page. This is change.org. So this is a third party site um, that is in connection with the, the Obama administration. And this change, how many of you have heard of change.org? OK, great. Looks about a third, maybe. Um, using change.org to figure out what citizens are interested in. What are the top issues? And of course, citizens can vote for the top issues, and those issues rise to the top. So this is an example of an external communication where they're trying to get more citizen input into government. You also have internal government communications through social network sites. This is called GovLoop, and this is a site for um, Government workers, I'm looking here, my notes. For government employees, public policy students, good government organizations, and government contractors, this is a site for them to share ideas. And I'm sorry that you can't see all the features, but it's very similar to the, the features we talked about. You can have your own page. You can have a blog. You can post ideas. There are forums. You can list events. And of course, you see front and center, the people are as important as the content. And this is a way they're hoping that we'll get government workers from all different agencies to communicate across boundaries. We also have, in the United States government, we have intelligence. Uh, Intellipedia, actually, is a Wikipedia for the intelligence community. So people in the United States intelligence, and this is not, of course, open to the public, can go to this Intellipedia site 
and post what they know about things happening in other countries. So it's a way to reduce barriers between agencies and pool their collective knowledge so that we can um, be strategic in how we communicate and stay safe in this country. These are just some of the examples. NASA, Social Security Organization, all branches of the military, the CIA, the Library of Congress, the Coast Guard, all have a social network site present for internal or external communication. And of course, we have college and university sites. Now, this is something that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, this is actually a site, a social network site that we are building here at the University of Minnesota in Facebook um, to get youth engaged in a particular issue that we care about, which is global warming. This is an example of a site that is trying to blend our interest in delivering content, educating youth about something, and interaction, having your own space. So as you can see, uh, and I wish you could see a little bit better here, but um, it's called Hot Dish. And so we feed stories about global warming so that youth can find out more about what's going on in the environment. But then they can also have a profile. And they can post a story themselves of they, that they found in the news. And they can join the action team, where they can do a series of challenges to stop global warming in their local community. So this is a blend of we as the educators are driving the content but we're also allowing interaction among youth, and we're allowing youth to contribute the content. And then finally, we're giving youth a place to act on their community and to document what they did. They can upload videos, audio files, write an essay about what they did to green their home or save energy in their home, turn up, uh, put a light bulb, a special light bulb in, in their um, lamps, and different challenges. And this is in partnership with News Cloud, as Dale mentioned. So these are just some examples.